Standing stones like this can be found all over the UK, but who actually built them and where did they live? This is the type of thing that archaeologists can tell us. Archaeologists now have a lot of tools available to them that they didn't have years ago. We're now going to take a look at some of these tools. Geophysics is a way of using physical elements of the Earth, or physical properties of the Earth, to look for anomalies which can give us a way of seeing beneath the ground so we can identify either you know, ditches or walls from features on land or find shipwrecks or buried paleo channels beneath the seafloor. Most people are very familiar with the term geophys or geophysics from Time Team where they obviously are normally working on land and what you're, you generally see in those programs are people using uh, magnetic gradiometer systems to detect small variations in the Earth's magnetic field and the reason those features show up is because the, the soils that are filling the ditches have different magnetic properties to the bedrock which the ditch is cut into. So it's just a way of using very quick tools to map out over an area what we think the spatial distribution of these features are, which we can then use in a GIS to plan or to plot against other sort of desk-based information to help the archaeologists work out where they need to um, target trial trenches and other parts of the excavation. There are lots of other different types of equipment that geophysicists use. So on land we have something called ground penetrating radar, which is very good at um, giving a sort of vertical slice down through the earth and different frequencies of antennas will give different depths of investigation. And they're very good systems to use over features like walls and uh, buildings. So if you have a villa, you can see that the, uh, the extent of the wall going down, maybe sort of a metre, metre and a half below the surface. Um, we also make use of things like laser scanning for recording um, buildings and structures. Things where um, recording of surface information is, is more important than, than lines and points. Um, for example, ruined castles, that kind of thing. This particular laser scan job was um, of a, a castle um, in, in the local area. Um, and we were commissioned to provide a, a record of the castle um, before they um, do some, some works on it, uh, which is one of the main um, ways in which we get involved in these projects. Uh, we use metric survey to provide an archaeological record of the current state of a structure. Um, traditionally, we would use instruments like the Total Station um, and uh, AutoCAD on a mobile tablet PC. So we would actually be creating an AutoCAD three-dimensional drawing on the tablet PC out in the field. Obviously, that's quite time consuming. Uh, we also have techniques such as rectified photography that we can deploy um, and photogrammetry as well. Um, but the, the laser scan allows us to very rapidly collect um, what I would describe as quite an objective data set. Um, it's it's non-discriminatory. The laser scanner simply fires out um, tens of thousands of laser beams a second and records everything in its path. So. Um, the, the scan data set that we have here um, comprises 13 scan stations um, dotted around the castle to give us maximum coverage. Um, these are then registered together to produce one coherent three-dimensional point cloud of the entire castle. My name is Sue Nelson. I am the finds supervisor at Wessex Archaeology and basically that means that I oversee all the finds that come in from site. Um, it can be from a variety of different sites and obviously finds themselves can be a, a huge variety but the majority of what we get is stuff like pottery, animal bone, some metal work, uh, a lot of flint from this area. When it comes in it's covered in mud, it all has to be washed but the important thing even at the point of the washing is that we must never lose the context information, we must never lose sight of where it came from on the site. Once the stuff has been washed it's then laid out to dry and as soon as the finds are dry they're then marked. In each individual piece of pottery, piece of animal bone or whatever is marked with the site code so that we know which site it came from and with the context information, the layer from which it came this end of the building it's very labour intensive. Um, we often have eight, ten people in here washing, marking and putting things on the database. Once 
That has happened, everything is rebagged into clean bags and it's put into different boxes depending on which museum it's ultimately going to go to. And then after that it is passed to the individual experts. It's then fed for them to write their individual reports which are then collated into a final report. Sometimes we're faced with a situation on site where there's something so complex and so delicate um, and with so many different objects involved and, and multiple layers involved, sometimes the best thing to do is actually to lift the entire block of soil and bring it into the finds room where our conservator will very, very carefully and painstakingly reveal all the things in it. Now those individual objects that you see on there, there's some Anglo-Saxon brooches, big brooches, and whole strings of beads this comes from a cemetery site in Leicestershire. And where those brooches were in the ground and the most important of the beads, it will again have been 3D'd in at the time so that we know to within a centimetre exactly where it was on the Earth's surface in terms of depth and lateral spacing. <laughs>